Hello my beautiful watchers and welcome back to Lost in Adaptation, the internet review show that looks to see how loyal film adaptations are to the books they're based on. Stormbreaker, published in the year 2000, is the first of the Alex Ryder novels, a long-running and, as far as I'm aware, ongoing series of books by English author Anthony Horowitz. Targeted at, and very popular amongst young audiences, it sold well enough to warrant ten sequels, the latest of which came out in 2017. The basic concept of Stormbreaker can be summed up very easily. It's James Bond for children. Going into a little more detail, it's what you'd get if you turned a James Bond movie into a book about a 14-year-old boy. I specify movie because, as I've mentioned in episodes past, the original James Bond of the books actually lacks a lot of what are considered the quintessential Bond tropes. The series was already on its sixth book when the film rights were procured for the first. Stormbreaker was a collaborative effort between studios from the UK, USA and Germany, and Howitz himself was brought on to write the screenplay. As discussed in the past, this is not always, but is usually usually a very good sign adaptation-wise for obvious reasons. The film came out in 2006 worldwide. For some reason I'm yet to fathom, it was given the alternative title Alex Ryder, Operation Stormbreaker for the US release, which is odd, because in both the book and the film, Stormbreaker is not the Operation codename. It's the new type of computer designed by the villain. I'm also given to understand they put out a really misleading trailer in the US that seemed to suggest a different kind of story than was actually in the film. Reception to this movie was so poor they cancelled the sequel that Howitz was already writing, and everyone gave up on the idea of trying to adapt anything Alex Ryder related for over a decade. So, was this a bad film, a bad adaptation, both, or just the victim of bizarre marketing decisions? Before we discuss that, let's take a quick look at the book. Not having read them, I don't know if later Alex Ryder novels managed to work out their own sense of identity, but Stormbreaker at least certainly follows the Bond film formula 100% beat for beat. The PowerPoint presentation of the villain, the gadgets man, the facade, the pointless dick measuring, the infiltration, getting caught, the bad guy explaining his plans in full, then choosing a convoluted and ineffective method of execution, the escape, the climactic action scene, and the last minute save of the world, or at least a recognisable percentage of it. The only thing missing is Bond's copious amount of sex, because, you know, 14 year old boy. By the way, if you're wondering if the people who held the copyright for James Bond were mad about any of this, it turns out, no, they actually quite liked it. So much so they hired Howitz to write some actual James Bond novels for them. Not as relevant, but it amused me that there were just as many product placements in this book as in your average Bond film. In the first few chapters alone, the book name drops the Nintendo 64, Marks and Spencer, Burger King, Nike, the Game Boy Color, and Gap. That these books were written for children is inescapable and more obvious with every chapter, and I can cannot in good conscience claim they will hold much appeal for an adult reader, they just lack the required creativity. As it happens, I did actually give this book a go when I was age appropriate for it, but I distinctly remember giving up at some point very early on in Mild Disgust, having decided the writing style was a crappy Harry Potter ripoff, and that the main character was clearly far too perfect to be of any interest. Looking back, that actually makes a lot of sense, as being naturally good at everything is Bond's MO, and while I still think it's a blatant imitation of J.K. Rowling's writing style, I've since come to realise that being influenced by popular authors is not in fact a crime or even necessarily a bad thing. I admittedly had a bit of a bad habit of making quick judgmental decisions about books back when I was a wee nipper, but in my defence I wasn't a critic back then so I had no particular incentive to give something a fair chance if I didn't feel like it. All that said, while I never cared for these books as a kid and I'm too old to really get anything out of them now, their appeal is still obvious. It's pure power fantasy for young children mostly boys. It's that daydream we had about being a badass secret agent that a halfway talented author had the bright idea to monetize by turning into a book. It's also a book that understands what its young audience is interested in. There's a long description of Alex's customized bicycle and short technical blurbs of all the cool guns and vehicles that show up for out. Now you would think what with this book following a movie formula that it would be a piece of cake to adapt into a successful picture. However, this movie is bad. This movie is bad, bad. Not so bad it's funny, just bad. Let's start with the lead, Alex Pettifier playing Alex Ryder. All the way through the movie, he does this thing where he talks really slowly and clearly and plays up his British accent as much as he can so everyone can be super sure that he's British, but a side effect is that nothing he sees sounds even remotely human-like, and there's all these unnatural pauses between words. A fun fact, Pettifier was also offered the lead role in Aragon, but turned it down in favour of Stormbreaker. Fortunately for Aragon, there was not a shortage of young, handsome British actors with no talent and silly haircuts. However, as bad as his performance was, I don't actually blame Mr. Pettifier for his or the rest of the movie's failures. When I went to university, I decided to primarily pursue a course in film production, so my expertise lies more in the practical aspects of filming and editing, and as a result, sometimes even the most simplistic points of film 
theory and critique are lost on me. However, in this case it's pretty obvious even to me that the film's director, Jeffrey Sachs, is the real problem here. Sachs's IMDb page isn't small, but it also isn't particularly impressive either, with his other productions ranging from the obscure to the forgettable. Everyone in this film, the leads, the supporting cast, and every single extra were clearly encouraged to be as hammy as possible in everything they did, and the cinematography matches that tone exactly. Even actors who have proven themselves extremely competent in the past were clearly directed into shocking performances, making bizarre gestures and delivery choices throughout. Sax's directing also has a habit of undercutting jokes that were halfway amusing in the books. For example, the line about picturesque fishing villages not being a particularly nice place to visit if you're a fish is immediately followed by a dead fish being thrown around, just in case you didn't understand the punchline. Not helping matters, Mickey Rourke, one of the biggest names attached, and the film's villain clearly saw the writing on the wall early on in regards to this production, and delivered the most phoned-in, no-shits-given performance known to man. Also not helping matters, while I can totally understand the desire to cast an older actor in the lead role, Pettifier does not look 14 in this. The boy band haircut they gave him doesn't make him look a day younger than the 17 years he was at the time of filming. On top of that, Sax, I can only assume unintentionally, does everything in his power to draw attention to this fact, including surrounding Pettifier with actual school children in the opening. How do you do, fellow kids? What? and not removing the book's lines about him being a pipsqueak despite him being taller than some of the actors around him. Despite this, the film still tries to portray him being in combat fatigues in boot camp as if this were some super bizarre imagery, but you can join the army at age 16 in the UK, he looks perfectly age appropriate. There's a lot more I'd like to say about this film's many and fascinatingly incompetent failings, but this isn't supposed to be that kind of review, and there's so much to deconstruct it would take two sarcastic British reviewers to cover the whole thing. Fortunately, that's something that actually happened. If you'd like to see me team up with Film Brain and really tear this crap apart, there's the thing. The short version is the mystery of why this film didn't do very well wasn't hard to solve. However, it might not have been the only factor. Let's talk adaptation. <laughs> We have yet another occasion here where, judging by the Patreon survey, enough people have not had any experience with either version of the story that I might have been inclined to include a synopsis of the story before starting the review, however I am spared this extra effort due to the film sticking to so much of the book's original plot, had I bothered to do so I would simply be repeating myself word for word in this segment. The police coming to Alex's London home to tell him that his uncle, Ian Ryder, had been killed supposedly in a car crash. The gloomy funeral, during which a work friend of his uncle's introduces himself, followed by Axe coming home to see a bunch of men taking Ian's stuff away in a van. Alex tracking the van to a scrapyard where he finds his uncle's car riddled with bullets. In an act of questionable intelligence, Alex taking refuge inside said car, which is then lifted into the crusher with him inside it. Successfully, though narrowly escaping a messy death, Alex is then brought into Ian's former workplace, which turns out to be a front for MI6. The slimy bug is in charge, blackmailing the lad into signing up to be a secret agent via threatening to deport his American housekeeper turned guardian, and sending him to train with the army for a few weeks where he's bullied by the full-grown trainees for a bit before eventually earning their respect. Alex being given the scoop on his target, an immigrant entrepreneur named Sale who MI6 suspects has dark motivations after he announced that he plans to donate one of his newly designed computers named Stormbreakers to every school in Britain. An obvious Q ripoff outfitting young Ryder with a bunch of gadgets including a yo-yo zipline, a Nintendo product that's a multifunction computer, and a tube of zit cream that's actually a chemical that can eat through metal. Alex being switched with a competition winner who was going going to become the first kid to test out the Stormbreaker, which leads to him travelling south to Cornwall and meeting Sale, his butler Mr. Grin, his assistant Nadia Vol, and his pet Jellyfish. Alex trying out the Stormbreaker, but quickly sneaking off to look around the facility, overhearing that there's going to be a mysterious shipment coming in at the beach at 3am, so sneaking out at night to have a look. Seeing renowned Russian assassin Yasin Gagorovich overseeing some containers being brought in, and shooting a man for dropping one. Sometime, and a few awkward conversations with Sale later, Alex sneaks through an abandoned tin mine into Sale's underground secret lab and observes the Stormbreaker computers getting injected with something that everyone seems very keen to avoid spilling. Eventually getting caught in his espionage, Alex is treated to a full explanation of Sale's plan and the reasoning behind it. Sale, apparently having been bullied as a kid for being an immigrant and annoyed that his main antagonist had grown up to become the Prime Minister, had decided to turn his new computers into chemical weapons designed to release a deadly virus when switched on. Supposedly as a publicity stunt, he had then offered the honour of bringing all the new computers online 
building, now housed inside every British school, to the Prime Minister, in the hopes that when everyone found out he'd press the button that killed all of the country's children, it would ruin him forever. Sale then flying off to put this into action, leaving his henchmen to finish off Alex, who apparently decided it would be really funny to throw him into the deadly jellyfish tank. Alex using his metal-eating zit cream to escape, hijacking an air vehicle, parachuting into the launch event, and shooting the apparatus, saving millions. Sale making a last-minute attempt to kill Alex in revenge, but getting shot himself by Grigorovich in a surprise twist. Grigorovich revealing that he works for a shadowy criminal organization that was helping Sale, but had decided he was too much trouble now that his plan had failed. Being a professional, he shows no particular interest in killing Alex, and is completely unfazed by Alex revealing that he knows that Grigorovich was the one who killed his uncle, and swearing revenge. Physically, Petafia makes for an okay Alex Ryder, aside from his haircut and age, as he is handsome and in athletic shape. No real complaints about Andy Serkis's portrayal of Mr. Grin, though one could say that playing a mute character was a waste of his considerable talents. His backstory about being a knife juggler who attempted to catch a blade in his teeth, but was distracted by his mother waving to him from the audience, is also book loyal. Nadia Vol seems accurate enough in principle with her pronounced German accent and excessive makeup. The main problem with her, though, is that she's one of the actors who was clearly encouraged to chew as much scenery as possible by the director. Both the book and the film don't seem to realise that, seeing as Sale has been operating on British soil his entire adult life, the threat he poses is a domestic one, and therefore would have been the concern of MI5, not MI6, but I guess that's not the one with Bond brand recognition. The gadgets that Alex is given by Not Q are good as well, with his mechanised yo-yo abseiling line and metal dissolving zit cream, though amusingly, his original Nintendo product was a Game Boy Color, now a Nintendo DS. If they do ever decide to reboot this movie, it will undoubtedly become a Nintendo Switch, so I guess we should all be glad they didn't try to make one during the Wii U era. Heyo! Well, that was a surprisingly full category. Even with Horowitz in charge of writing, I just assumed the film had to have gone way off book for it to have bombed so hard, but it's not, it's just not. Colour me surprised. The general theme of this adaptation seems to be to dial down what little subtlety the book had and dial up the action and the stupid as much as possible. For starters, the film invented and jammed in that ridiculous chase scene at the beginning that involved terrorist action taking place in a British town in broad daylight and several innocent bystanders dying horribly that is somehow completely overlooked by the rest of the country, along with the clumsily juxtaposed speech that Alex makes about how completely unremarkable his uncle is. Ian Ryder's death takes place just before the story starts in the book, and you find out it happened rather differently than the film chose to portray it. Rather than a highly trained field agent arbitrarily deciding that he was safe now after receiving clear proof that he wasn't, and turning his music up so loud he couldn't hear a helicopter a few metres above him, then not swerving and slamming his car into an assassin outside his window, even though he just fought off an army of other henchmen using, amongst other things, lightning fast reflexes, and Grigorovich having, presumably because of a secret flair for theatrics, paused in his murder long enough to make eye contact with him, Ian Rider was in fact killed in an ambush by machine gun fire that racked along the side of his car, which makes him seem like less of a nitwit, and avoids the question as to why and how Grigorovich had emptied his gun clips into the door of the car after successfully shooting the driver in the face. It also happened in the dead of night in the book, in a secluded area away from witnesses. You know, like an assassination. Dwarfing the problems brought about by the extra scene at the start is the lunacy of the scenes added onto the end. In the book, after Alex shoots the button that would have activated the Stormbreakers, that definitively foils Sale's plans, as he was so obsessed with making sure it was his nemesis, the Prime Minister, that unknowingly murdered all the UK's children, he'd rigged it so there was no other way to unleash the virus. As I mentioned, Sale does try to get revenge on Alex. He kidnaps him in a fake taxi, forces him to a rooftop helipad at gunpoint, and plans to shoot him there before fleeing the country, but is double-crossed by Grigorovich, who kills him to stop him from embarrassing his employers any further. It's all over in less than half a chapter. The film clearly wanted something a little bit grander to end on, so it set up the twist that Sale had a backup plan in place, with another way to send out the activation signal located, rather dramatically, at the top of his London skyscraper. Realising this at the last minute, Alex has to rush to the tower to stop him, enlisting the serendipitous transportation of a girl he'd struck out with at the start of the film named Sabina. Even though they get there before Sale can complete his plan, it looks like the old geezer has gotten the better of them, but in a return to the book, Sale is shot by Grigorovich, who also decides to save Alex from falling to his death because he impressed him with his pluck earlier in the film. 
Now you would have thought that the problem with this new ending to the adventure would be glaringly obvious. Because Sale had another way of completing his evil scheme that he was very close to successfully utilizing, Gregorovich killing him goes from a nefarious organization tying up loose ends to a bunch of morons actively foiling their own plan. To clarify, just to make super sure we're all on the same page, if Homeland here hadn't gotten involved, his team would have won. With those bullets, he invalidated all of the work and money his organization had poured into this attack and he had personally murdered a British agent for and executed a man for endangering. Sweet, merciful tester, did no one proofread this script before filming? <sighs> Moving on, Alex originally tracked down the scrapyard where his uncle's car was through research and deductive reasoning, but why bother establishing that your protagonist is intelligent when you can show him doing cool bike stuff while tailing a white van? MI6 is not underneath a train station in the book, and there's not a super inefficient secret access to it that you can clearly see is screwy simply by watching it for a few minutes. It's supposed to just be, you know, a building that's pretending to be a bank. Alex walks in through the front door, but gosh, I wonder why they could possibly want to make the start of his adventure take place in a London train station. So what is this place? Hogwarts? Oh. Okay, I guess they're not even trying to hide the fact that this film, just like the book before it, is desperate to tap into that sweet, sweet Harry Potter money. Fair enough, I can't fault them for honesty of purpose, I guess. In the book, Alex notices something is amiss because one man at his uncle's funeral exposes that he has a gun for half a second. In the movie, everyone in the fucking cemetery is either packing heat or jamming their finger in an earpiece while dressed like Agent Smith from The Matrix. They still play it up like Alex is being super perceptive, but you'd have to be blind to miss this parade. There's no ejector seat in Ian Ryder's car in the book or any indication that it was anything other than a normal BMW. There was no easy way out for Alex. He had to drag himself out leaving a trail of blood, sweat, and oil just as the car crusher was finishing its work. It's one of two surprisingly intense moments in the book. You do have to wonder how the fuck the film version of MI6 decided that Ian's car needed rockets, ejector seats, onboard computers, and goodness knows what else, but somehow decided that bulletproofing wasn't necessary. Another film-only addition to the story is the apparent belief that every third person in Britain is a raving, murderous psychopath, and I want to make it clear, I'm not just talking about people associated with the villains. I mean just... Everyone. Now, admittedly, in the book, there was an MI6 agent in the scrapyard who took a shot at Alex, but in his defense, Alex had just kicked him in the head, so he probably wasn't thinking straight. In the film's universe, apparently, a group of junkyard workers' first response to finding out that they had just nearly accidentally killed a teenager is to first attempt to beat the shit out of him and then to try to blow his face off with a fucking shotgun. These wankers aren't even connected to MI6. The government just outsources their scrap work to them for budgetary reasons. Then, infinitely worse, Worse, during the climax, when Alex and Sabina are riding to Sales Tower, they happen to pass through a battalion of mounted royal guards, who, with absolutely zero idea of what's going on or who these teenagers are, promptly attempt to chase them down and murder them with their ceremonial swords. I say, those kids aren't supposed to be riding here. Well, that's a death sentence. Charge! What the hell even is this movie? One of the most consistent additions throughout the film's plot is Jack and her antics. At least in the first Alex Rider book, Jack is something of a nothing character, just there to be a reason for the plot to advance. She doesn't even know any of the events of the book took place. Less charitably, you could also say that in the absence of a love interest to motivate Alex, she's the fill-in princess in distress for him to fight for. Her fixation with Japanese culture, her coming along with Alex to track down Crawley, the worst edited fight scene in the history of cinema with Vol, and her helping out at the climax are all film only. I would usually be okay with developing someone like this into a real character, unfortunately this is one of many films that seems to have mistaken giving a character quirks with giving them development, so she just ends up being a completely unnecessary addition to the plot, and in my opinion an unfunny and annoying one. As hyped up as most of the film is compared to the book, you could still actually make the case that book Alex is a tad more reckless than his film counterpart, who has set the challenge of simply finding his way into MI6. Originally they left him in a room adjacent to his uncle's locked former office and watched to see what he would do. Evidently the curiosity of what his late relative's workplace looked like was enough for him to climb out onto the side of the building several stories up and jump and swing off a flagpole through the window. This version of Alex is probably safer being sent on dangerous missions by the government as he impulsively does some very stupid things when left to his own devices. In addition to not making him look any younger and dating the movie considerably, film Alex's haircut is not as described in the book. Though considering in the book it's described as being brown and short all over except for two long strands at the front. Uh, objection? 
I guess it's not all that surprising the filmmakers decided to go in a different stylistic direction. Wolf's book antics were much more than just the childish bullying of the film. He attempted to accidentally kick Alex in the head during a climb, tripped him while he was carrying hot food, and finally went as far as to push him into a trapped room right on top of a flashbang grenade. Alex chooses not to press charges even when the drill sergeant reveals he has the whole thing on tape. He even goes as far as to save Wolf's arse later when he freezes up during a parachute jump and Alex pushes him out of the door before anyone can see finally earning Wolf's respect, albeit in a rather strange way. They also don't bring Wolf and the squad back at the end of the book. Alex already had a gun on him originally, so he didn't need his BFF to throw him one. It's not as stupid a change as some of the others the film made, but it's still a bit of a staggering coincidence that he was there, and a little bit weird that they think the SAS would be tapped to guard a science museum. I was mildly offended that the film decided to deviate from the book in order to take part in some mild nerd bashing, going out of its way to make it clear that Alex isn't one of those lame dweebs who likes computers and stuff. As it happens, Book Alex loved geeky things and wasn't embarrassed about that. He already had a working knowledge of the new technology involved in the Stormbreaker. Even though he knew there was something fishy about it, he genuinely took an interest in the computer when he was testing it out, and it was mentioned that he and the lad who won the computer magazine competition look kind of similar. Even if you ignore the fact that it's off book, this kind of casual mean-spiritedness towards people who like technology is very much a relic of the 80s and 90s. By 2006, the rise of geekdom in popular culture was already well underway, and this film really has no excuse for being so out of touch. In an attempt to recreate James Bond's unflappable blasé attitude, the film added a scene where Alex makes a poor taste joke about a man's disfiguring injury right to his face. Unfortunately, as Pettifier lacks the charisma of even the least successful Bond actor, it just comes off as a bit mean-spirited. There's little touches throughout the film that give it a bit more of a goofier edge than the book. For example, in the book, when Blunt is asked why MI6 is investigating Sale, he tells Alex they've been monitoring him for years and suspect he might have ill intentions because he has business and personal ties to several countries recently and historically hostile towards the United Kingdom. When asked the same question in the film, he simply jokes that, well, we don't trust anyone. It's sort of what we do snorts, and then makes a comedically awkward expression. The Stormbreaker itself is confusing in the film. In the book, it's just a computer. It's a nice computer, and apparently it's using a new type of computer chip that makes mass production cheaper, but a computer nonetheless. Monitor, keyboard, mouse, you know, the standard setup. The film decided to go with this Ready Player One-esque fully immersive VR affair. This is a change that I'm prepared to assume was as much a result of timing as it was the film wanting to up the ante in all things. When the book was written in the year 2000, it wasn't unheard of for British public schools to have the odd computer, but the idea of them having something cutting edge with high-tech learning aids was definitely novel. Government funding for public schools in Britain has always left a little to be desired. Despite that, because this was a period of such rapid increase in public access to technology, just six years later when the film came out, the idea that a company donating a single computer to each public school would be national newsworthy or a great PR boost for the Prime Minister was somewhat laughable, so they had to find a better reason for the Stormbreaker to be a game-changer. However, However, one cannot help but notice a few problems with this, starting with HOLY FUCK THEY REALLY PLAN TO BUILD ONE OF THOSE GOTHIC MONSTROSITIES IN EVERY SCHOOL IN GREAT BRITAIN? LOOK AT THE ROOM SIZE REQUIREMENTS, WHAT ARE THEY GONNA DO, CONVERT THE GYM INTO A COMPUTER LAB? AND EVEN IF YOU CAN FIND THE SPACE FOR IT, YOU CAN ONLY PLUG ONE KID AT A TIME INTO THESE BAD BOYS, IT'S HARDLY GONNA REVOLUTIONIZE THE EDUCATION SYSTEM. IN THE NOVEL, ALEX SLIPS UP ON HIS FIRST DAY AT THE JOB AND INTRODUCES HIMSELF TO SALE USING HIS REAL NAME, FORCING HIM TO SCRAMBLE TO INVENT A CONVINCING REASON FOR IT TO BE A NICKNAME. THE FILM SWITCHES THIS OUT FOR ALEX TRYING TO tough talk Nadia Vol by making very obvious hints about being on a mission to investigate the death of his uncle, even going as far as to mention the covered job that Ian was working when he died. As this is more of a deliberate act, Alex comes off looking significantly stupider in the film, made worse when you realise his inability to keep his mouth shut directly led to the attempt on Jack's life. Speaking of which, to find a reason for Vol to be able to make her appointment with the worst fight scene ever, the film added in Alex bringing his personal phone along during his spy mission, proving again that it is fortunate that this version of him is really good at karate because he couldn't possibly have been recruited for his brain. On a significantly less frustrating note, the props department clearly never bothered to Google image search a Portuguese man o war at any point in the build up to this film. The other surprisingly intense part of this book that I alluded to earlier was when Alex had to swim through a submerged tunnel in the abandoned tin mine in order to sneak into Sales Lab, something he did despite being absolutely terrified and having no idea if he was going to make it through or die horribly in the cold dark waters. The film chose to replace this 
this with him just kind of overreacting to having to squeeze through a gap in the rocks. Gosh, Alex, that looks positively uncomfortable, you poor thing. The parachute backpack and dart firing pen are film original gadgets, and honestly, I really don't care for either. I mean, how the fuck did salespeople not notice the bag was a parachute when they were inspecting it? Was finding one of the helicopters really so unbelievable, and worse, this film seems to be under the impression that sodium pentothal is a mind control drug. In the book, Alex simply forced Mr. Grin to fly him to London at gunpoint. In a movie where people are unceremoniously shot for messing up, I have trouble believing they thought that was too dark for the audience. Sabina is a bit of a mixed bag adaptation-wise because, while she is technically from the Alex Rider books, she isn't supposed to show up until the third installment, and I'm given to understand acts rather differently than her film portrayal. Her appearance in this story is not at all surprising, as love interests are, and always have been, on the mandatory blockbuster checklist, and the filmmakers clearly realise the one and only thing missing from this book's almost perfect teen power fantasy was a member of the opposite sex to be there to witness the audience insert character being all badass and whatnot, because, let's face it, what's the point of saving the world if it doesn't get you a date with someone who previously turned you down for one? You get much more of a sense of just how resentful Alex is about being dragged into the espionage business against his will at the end of the book. In fact, you could say he looks a little smug about it in the end of the film. Alex wore a school uniform for quite a bit of the book, because, fun fact, pretty much every school in Great Britain has mandatory uniforms, but either they didn't want to confuse the international audience, or they didn't think uniforms were cool enough for this Alex Rider. They moved Alex finding out that Yasin Grigorovich was the guy who shot his uncle until later in the film. MI6 told him about it before he set off for Cornwall in the book, and promised to pull him out of the mission if he showed up again. So, when Alex saw him at the beach, he stopped sending them updates so they wouldn't withdraw him before he got a shot at avenging Ian. You can see in the film that henchmen occasionally get themselves killed while trying to murder Alex, through no fault of his own of course, as he never actively tries to kill anyone, even in self-defence. For the most part it's the same in the book, Alex can't possibly avoid casualties altogether when everyone's playing with guns on high places, but he almost never pursues a fatality. Almost never. There is one occasion where 14-year-old Alex Ryder is forced to intentionally end someone's life. I mentioned Mr. Grin was not under the fictitious effects of sodium pentothal when he transported Alex to London in the book. He was also flying a small plane, not a helicopter, but that's not really important. When Alex jumped out and activated his parachute, Mr. Grin turned the plane around and tried to liquidate him with the propeller. Alex predicted this might happen, so left his Game Boy Color cartridge smoke bomb underneath the seat. Once activated, Mr. Grin was completely blinded and crashed the plane dying in the resulting explosion. Lebanese Herod Sale becomes not Lebanese Darius sale in the film to better suit Mickey Rourke, and I'm inclined to resent any concessions the book had to make to accommodate this actor because of the aforementioned complete lack of interest he showed in the role and his performance. Rourke gives off the impression that he's bored of every conversation he's in, and while that might have actually suited other villains, Sale was a hyperactive, raving lunatic in the book once you got him going, so this really starts to cost the film serious adaptation points towards the end. The book has the somewhat bittersweet ending of Alex watching his uncle's killer escape scot-free, and dealing with the incredibly conflicting emotions brought on by him having just saved his life. The film tacked on the extra scene of him basking in the glory of his crush thinking he's a total badass now, and getting to play it off as if it were nothing, then... I don't know if this is supposed to be a cliffhanger or something, but he realises someone is watching him and poses dramatically. This film is a perfect, textbook example of people saying, ooh, what if, throughout the adaptation process, but completely neglecting to include any justification or purpose for their changes, leaving the audience scratching their heads and muttering, but why all the way through the film? What if, instead of having his own lab inside MI6, the guy who makes the gadgets for field agents was working in a toy shop? Okay, but... Why is he working in a toy shop? How is forcing your weapons and technology developer to waste his time dealing with bratty children advantageous in any way? What if Jack was a massive poser who liked to prepare meals using Japanese weaponry? Okay, but why? What could that possibly contribute to the plot? What if, instead of Alex earning Wolf's respect by not snitching on him, and after all his abuse still helping him out in a moment of weakness, he saved the unit from getting kicked out of the army by escaping from a house and throwing some innocent men off a cliff? Okay, but... Why would that even help matters? Busting out of a holding cell and assaulting the guards wouldn't retroactively make you pass the military exercise you just failed the night before, because... Why would it? What if, when Alex is using the Stormbreaker, he gets dramatically hit with a satellite in space and then attacked by a T-Rex? But why? It's supposed to be an educational program! That was so 
fucking random and pointless! The final point I wish to bring up in this segment is there is a very, 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 very fine line between parody and straight up rip off, and while you could arguably say the book just skirted that line and stayed on the right side of it, giving Alex just enough of his own personality to distance it from the inspiration, the film did not, adding in more Bond like one liners, shamelessly lifting elements out of popular Bond movies verbatim, and even stealing some of their long running jokes without any recognizable nod to the fact that they didn't come up with them. Don't do that! Why is it dangerous? No, it's very annoying. Don't touch that! It's my lunch. Just saying. The only significant absence in the film is the small chunk right in the middle of the book they ignored. In the film, Alex is listening in when Sale gets wise to him and decides to have him quietly killed, so scalpers before they can follow through. In the book, he is caught unawares, but fortunately, the villain's master plan to off him was to lead him out into a field using fake signposts and then send two dudes on quad bikes after him. Alex defeats these two foolish assailants and steals one of their bikes. After that, he went to the nearby town and followed up on some clues left behind by his uncle that eventually led him to the tin mine. Once again, it seems the filmmakers decided they didn't need any evidence that their lead was intelligent in any way, he just needed to be pretty and good at running through obstacles fast. Of course, this does leave the film with the plot hole of Alex deciding to go to the mines just because, but I guess that didn't matter to them. Shortly before this, Alex and Sale have a pool game during which Alex goads Sale into betting large amounts of money and then losing it all when Alex proved to be an expert at the game. While pointlessly antagonizing the man you're supposed to be spying on and, you know, might be a killer, may seem like a dumb move, it can be explained with the simple statement, well, that's what James Bond would have done. You do have to remind yourself that this world works on Bond film logic a few times throughout the book for it to make sense. On a final, amusing note, I'd like to mention that the film left out Alex accidentally shooting the Prime Minister at the end. Just a minor injury, but enough that it took a bit of the glory out of his victory. The Dom's final thoughts. I almost don't want to say it because this was such a naff movie, but with the exception of the questionable additions to the story, most notably at the start and end, I cannot deny that by usual adaptation standards this was a really loyal recreation of a book in film form. I believe I made it clear that I think the stuff they did add was groan worthy terrible, but at the end of the day I don't think that was enough to sink the whole adaptation. They hit almost all of the major plot points, and most of the minor ones as well, and Harowitz clearly made sure they understood the book's power fantasy appeal and built the film on that premise as well. All in all, I'd have to say this is an excellent and disappointing example of how you can succeed as an adaptation while simultaneously utterly failing as a film, which is kind of sad in this case because it really didn't have to be that way. Interestingly, Howard went on record not long after the film's release blaming its poor reception on his books not translating well to the big screen, but I would have to wholly disagree. With a competent director and a more invested cast, they could have made something really memorable here. But they did not, and the stigma it created around Stormbreaker was so bad when British TV network ITV announced last year that they intend to make a new attempt at adapting the Alex Ryder series, they revealed they plan to skip the first book entirely and start with the second, point blank. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Feel free to let me know in the comments what you thought of this Stormbreaker adaptation, and if you enjoyed this review, please consider helping me appease the algorithm God of YouTube by sharing it with your friends and getting to know that like button. See you soon. Hey beautiful watchers, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that there's a variety of rewards you can earn by becoming a Patreon, including early access to all videos, getting to be a part of the survey about how many people saw the film and read the book, or playing Minecraft with me on my 24 hour server. Higher level contributors can also join the Dom Skype chat room and best of all, choose future episodes of Lost in Adaptation. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the Dom, I can't do that, all of my currency recently became self aware and told me it loved me, I have not had the heart to spend any of it since then. Fear not, if you would instead be willing to like, share, subscribe, or a combination of all three, that goes a long way towards helping my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. Have a most pleasant day and I will see you soon.